Hi, I'm Linda Mal, and welcome to Art This Week. On this week's episode, we visit the Dallas Museum of Art and speak with curator Kimberly Jones about the exhibition, Inca, Conquest of the Andes. Now for Art This Week. Hi, I'm here at the Dallas Museum of Art with the assistant curator of the Arts of the Americas, Dr. Kimberly Jones, to talk about the exhibition Inca, Conquest of the Andes. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. Can you tell us a little, little bit about the production of these bags? Um, well, these bags are all uh, plain weave, warp-faced weave, um, and this one in particular, which is reminiscent of the late horizon style, largely, of course, under Inca rule, um, 1400 to 1532. We have some additional embroidery around the edges you, that you can see in the stripes on either side. And how did they acquire the materials um, in order to make these bags, like the fiber and the dyes? How did they come by these materials? Well, they herded uh, camelids, or llamas and alpacas, right. <laughs> mostly the domesticated versions. They also had the wild vicuña that they could hunt to get some of the fiber that was the most fine fiber from uh, the camelid species in the Andes. So the Inca themselves, by the late horizon, actually had um, llama herds for the state and oh, alpaca okay. herds for the state that they could um, shear the fiber uh, be, to be able to use and make some of these um, textiles. Prior to that, of course, the highland groups really herded a number of these animals in the upper zones and we think traded uh, quite a bit of that camelid fiber with the coast for cotton from the coast um, to be able to have both uh, primary resources for the making of textiles. And so for the dye, I know I read somewhere that there's these mollusks and other kind of plant fiber and stuff. So mm -hmm. um, what, what have, would have been used for these red colors or these cream colors? Do you know? We know this particular example hasn't been tested. Okay. Um, we are able to test a number of textiles and there's been great studies by some museum conservation departments in testing a number of the, the pre-Hispanic textiles. The majority of the red that comes out of the pre-Hispanic ones tends to be cochineal, which gives you a nice vibrant red, um, like we see in a number of the bags around us right. and in the great tapestry weave tunics that mm -hmm. we have in the exhibit. And then you also tend to have um, the natural fibers as well with different colors. So camelid fiber can have a natural from cream and white almost to uh, dark black. And you get the natural color brought in just as much as using plant dyes and um, the insect dyes from the cochineal. Wonderful. And what were these bags primarily used for in everyday life? Well, these particular ones, especially this classic design that you have here, um, was known as a chuspa in Quechua. Um, and they were used principally by males, we think, but also represented with females carrying them, and today still used by females in certain communities, to carry principally coca, mm -hmm. the coca leaf itself, which is so common to the Andes and has been in traditional use um, from very, very early in, in uh, the pre-Hispanic settlement of the highland zones to help kind of swage uh, the uh, altitude, the, <laughs> the effects of altitude on the body. Right, right. Yeah. Now, what kind of imagery is found on this specific tunic, and does it correlate at all with the status of the individual who would have worn this? Yes, this particular tunic um, is commonly known by scholars as the face fret, um, or some variation of that terminology, because it includes animate faces here that are a little stylized and abstracted. You can see the split eye of the mm -hmm. black and the white coloration, and then this long-standing Andean tradition by this point of the Wari Empire of having, or the Wari uh, polity, of having the intercrossed fangs. Mm -hmm. And so it's, they did it with a, an end design to connote the, the two fangs that are intercrossed in the mouth. So you see the faces and then opposite um, and paired with a kind of stepped, like terraced landscape or mountain design and fret that may um, symbolize water or this kind of balance to the mountainous landscape. And we know that some of these have been found in the coastal environments. This one probably came from the coastal region as well. It has a cotton-based warp with the camelid fiber woven on top, and it's a tapestry weave. So it's one of the finest styles of weaves that you have 
um, in the Andean tradition of weaving, which really allows for the interlinking of various colors of fibers. So you can see the bright red cochineal that we talked about, um, paired with some of the muted uh, greens and blues for indigo, and probably um, some other plant dyes to create that lighter yellow um, and oranges that we have in the design. Mm -hmm. And the examples of representation on ceramics, uh, of wari ceramic individuals wearing this type of tunic, the face fret type, sometimes have elements of military association and um, on occasion also wear the, the um, four-cornered hats that we have in this exhibit. That's why I paired these close together. So this connection between a higher status, probably not the highest elite in war mm -hmm. society, but a very high status to have been gifted or received this wonderful, um, very fine tapestry weave tunic. All right, so what can you tell us about this Urpu? I know it was the, one of the most common um, Inca ceramic pieces. Um, what can you tell us about the style and why it was made the way it was made? Well, these were often called, when they were first studied and found, um, especially in the area around Cusco, as aribalos, um, relating them to the Greek ceramic form, the Urpu term coming from Quechua. Mm -hmm. And these Urpu uh, served to store corn beer that could actually be poured then into the most common cup or goblet style um, vessels that were used for the drinking of the corn beer known in their wooden form as queros or in their metal form as aquillas. And so this uh, particular example because of its size probably served for an individual relation uh, between two people sharing uh, a corn beer feast together, a small setting. And they were perfect for uh, carrying the corn beer, probably by the female who made the corn beer and provided it to males in festive um, occasions. Uh, the rope would be wrapped around and through the handles for support and then passed over the lug, as we call it, usually made into a feline face to keep a <laughs> stability on uh, the, the vessel itself while it was poured on in the on the back. back. Right, mm -hmm. okay. We want to thank Kimberly for speaking with us. For more information on the exhibition, go to dma.org. That's it for Art This Week. Thanks for watching. I still got your polar